Welcome everyone. In this session, we have Leslie, who is a data scientist consultant at Bristol Myers Squibb. She spent several years as a research scientist at UW, automating data cleaning for health genetics research studies. She is presenting data cleaning for lazy people, how to automate data cleaning responsibly. So just a quick note that please post your questions to the Q&A box instead of the chat. Uh, Leslie, a reminder to start your timer, so off to you. Okay, great. Uh, thank you for joining me today, everyone. I'm really excited to talk about one of my favorite subjects, which is data cleaning and some approaches that you can use to automate it for the greatest impact. So I'm showing here a diagram of the data science workflow that I've borrowed from an article at the communications of the ACM, um, which you can get to at that link at the bottom. Um, and in this diagram, as in the minds of many data scientists, uh, data cleaning is seen as a roadblock to getting to the real work of data analysis. And the author even goes so far as to say that data cleaning is an obstacle that must be overcome, and it's not the actual substantive analysis. Um, and I want to challenge this idea. Um, and to do that, I want to look more in detail at what is happening in that one small box um, that is the data cleaning step in this larger data science workflow. So data cleaning is actually many different but related tasks. And it's a very complex part of the workflow of data science that actually has its own separate workflow um, within that. So it starts with collecting and reformatting the data to um, get it into the place where you're going to work with it, validating it to identify issues that you need to address, um, deciding what corrections to make to fix the issues that you found, deciding on any adjustments that you need to make to make the data easier to work with. Um, and then once you have a good set of um, cleaned base data, then you can start to derive new variables and engineer new features. Um, and then on top of all of these complex steps, you have a layer of iteration that's going on here. So you might run your data through your analysis and find out that there was a cleaning issue that you didn't address properly and you need to iterate on that. You might need to run the same data cleaning process on additional data records of the same format, or you might want to add in additional data records coming from a different source that might be in a different format. So this is why this is a task that we're spending so much time on because it's a bunch of different things all lumped into this one broad category and with many iterations on top of that. Um, and what I want to show you today is some example code that I put together in this repository on GitHub. And to have a concrete example to talk about, I downloaded a example data set from Seattle Open Data, which is monthly checkouts per title in the Seattle Public Library catalog. And this table shows an overview of what that data set looks like with the column names on the left part of the table, a description of each variable, um, and the data type that is expected. So all of the examples that I'm going to talk about are again in this GitHub repository, and they'll be focused on this example Seattle Public Library checkouts data set. So going back to this data cleaning workflow that I've laid out, these are the steps that I identified as needing to be done for the, um, the library checkouts data set. So first I had to get the data from the API. And then for validation, I identified a couple of issues, including a variable that should have been a year, but was showing up as a string. Um, another variable that was in all caps, which would make it inconvenient to use as labels later on, and some unexpected duplicates. Then I decided how to correct each of these issues, um, starting with using a regular expression to pull out the years from the string data, creating a variable that has comma-separated values for the year, and removing the duplicates. And then uh, for adjustments, converting the 
variable that was in all caps to lowercase to make it easier to use, and um, engineering a couple of new variables from the publication year CSV variable that I had fixed in order to make it into a numeric column that you could use more easily in analysis. So now I want to use this concrete example of the Seattle Public Library checkouts data to go over a few um, potential design patterns to use for automating your data cleaning workflows. And I'll go through some highlights of how to use each of these design patterns they're going to be increasing the level of automation as I go through these examples. Um, and again, the examples are shown in detail in the code repository on GitHub, and I'll just show a few, a few brief snapshots. So the first design pattern I think most people are probably familiar with, and this is to write a reproducible script or notebook, and it's reproducible in the way that you can run it from end to end without any interaction. So you're not using a, a Jupyter notebook where you're running cell by cell and making changes. You're not um, writing R code and running it interactively line by line. You are compiling the entire report all at once. And the screenshot on the left here shows a small snippet of a data cleaning notebook that I wrote for this example code. And you can see the table of contents in blue shows um, each of the steps from the workflow that I've just talked about. The important things to do to make this reproducible are to track your dependencies. Um, and like I said, make sure that it can run end to end without interaction. And there are some really interesting existing tools for this um, that are basically data profilers. You can, you can put in a data frame and it will run some standard checks and build some standard plots for you. And that's one way that you can automate things to make it faster to put together these reproducible notebooks. At the next level of iteration, you can make a generalized template. And this involves basically going through and making it so that your reproducible code can be run on more than one specific data file. So the code blocks I'm showing on the left here show one way of generalizing some code to review the um, unique categorical values for five different variables. And the code block on the bottom shows how that's generalized by um, using a list of the categorical variable names that you want to check. And you could generalize that further by um, examining properties of the variables in your data frame to automatically build this list of categorical variables. You can also start to use parameterization. So these code blocks that I'm showing show on the top the way to define an R markdown document with um, just statically defined uh, variables for the title and author. And then the parameterized version of that on the bottom shows that you're passing in parameters for the data file that's going to show up in the title, the author, and automatically setting the time at the, the time that the notebook is compiled. At the next level of iteration, you can build a custom package or module full of functions or classes for common data cleaning tasks or common types of data sets that you're working with. And this code snippet shows the collapsed code for the functions in the data cleaning package in the example that I wrote. Um, so I think the, the function names are pretty self-explanatory and in general, these functions take as arguments a data frame and the variables that you want to run the checks on. Um, and potential arguments for how to run those checks. And there are some interesting existing tools to look into here. So once you have that package, or if you're using an existing package, then you also need a script that will use those package functions to perform your data cleaning. And that script will often be much shorter than um, any of the previous types of data cleaning design patterns would be. 
And the last example that I'll talk about is building a pipeline for data cleaning. And this is an example where I think it makes the most sense to start off by using some of the wonderful existing tools for pipelining things that are already out there, which I have listed some examples on this slide. So basically you're taking some of the reproducible scripts that you've already written um, and putting them together in a pipeline using one of these pipeline tools. And um, there are some other considerations for this design pattern that you want to keep in mind. So if you are basically running the same, running the pipeline on data that you think will have a consistent set of problems over and over again, and doesn't have to be as flexible, then you can make a fully automated pipeline. If instead you are running your pipeline on data, especially that's entered by users, then you might want to consider a human in the loop pipeline. And that's a situation where you would have the pipeline output a couple of suggestions for how to proceed with data cleaning, have a human review that and enter in instructions for how the pipeline should proceed. Um, and then the pipeline would go on to finish those data cleaning steps. And then with both of these patterns, you would want to make sure that you have appropriate logging, monitoring, and alerts set up so that you notice if there is, for example, any drift in your data that needs to be accounted for by some change in your data cleaning process. Um, and then if you look at the code examples accompanying each of these design patterns that I've described, there are a few general principles that start to become evident. So the first one is not to automate the decision-making parts of things at first. There are other parts that are the things that make the most sense to start to automate. This is things like making plots for certain kinds of variables, identifying missing values, checking allowed values, and so on. You should also make sure to preserve your original data, um, and this makes the iterative nature of this process much easier to have the same starting point. You want to make sure that your code is reproducible um, for all of these different design patterns so that you can get the same results with the same code and the same data. And you can make that easier using version control and data version tracking. And making things more generalizable will make it easier to automate things on a wider variety of data sets. And then finally, you want to be documenting all of the steps as you go along. So documenting within your code, documenting issues that you run into in the data and how you addressed them, um, and also how to run your scripts with things like the environment and dependencies. Now, what I want to leave you with is um, thinking about how to get the most out of your time data cleaning. And in order to do this, it's really a trade-off between the amount of effort that you put into your automation and the amount of impact that you get out of it. So on the left, I'm showing some of the factors that increase the input of, or sorry, increase the effort of automating your data cleaning process. So higher scale is higher effort and so on. And then on the right, I'm showing factors that increase the impact of what you've automated. So for instance, if you have multiple data scientists using the data set that you've cleaned, then that's much higher impact than if only one person is using it. And then this is all scaled by the number of users who are affected by your use of that data set. And the thing to keep in mind here is that the effort that you put in to a data cleaning automation should really scale with the impact that you're going to get out of it. So it should look like this approximate line where the um, lower effort design patterns, like a reproducible script or notebook, um, are used for lower impact problems and pipelines are used for very high impact problems. And what you don't want to end up with is an example like this, where you put a great deal of effort into building a pipeline and you find out that it's actually a very low impact 
problem. Not many people are using that data set. And so it wasn't necessarily worth your time or effort. So I want to leave you with that idea of thinking carefully about the effort and impact of your data cleaning solutions. And thank you for your attention. And I'm happy to take questions. Thank you for the talk, Leslie. We'll now transition to Q&A. Uh, Leslie, please see the Q&A tab for questions from the attendees. Sure. Um, <clears throat> so someone has asked if I've shared the GitHub page. Um, I can put the link in the chat once I'm done sharing my slides. Okay. And the next question is, how do you go about identifying which fields or values are most critical in cleaning? And how do you go about estimating the time required to clean the data set? So the, the way that you would identify which fields are most critical is really by making sure that you are keeping clear communication with the people who are going to be using the data set. You know, try to understand the type of analysis that it's going into. Um, and make sure that you're on the same page. Um, you shouldn't be data cleaning something in isolation that you're just going to pass off to someone and not care about where it goes. Um, and then estimating the time required. I think my baseline would be take however much you think, however much time you think it's going to take and multiply that by maybe 10. And that's probably a good starting point. Um, but like I said, it's an iterative process. You might never be done with data cleaning because when once it gets to the analysis, you're going to find new issues that you need to address. Hmm. Okay, this is an interesting question about how the data cleaning process differs when you're using third party data versus in house data. And I would say my experience has mostly been with third party data um, as a research scientist working with research that was done at other institutions. So a lot of what I had to do for that was digging through the available documentation. And I often couldn't find, um, you know, a good point of contact who had extra information when I might have needed it. So I needed to make informed choices. Um, just based on the data in front of me versus with in-house data, you might be actually you might actually be able to find um, the data expert who was in, in charge of collecting that data and you could ask them directly for more questions. So I think that's the biggest difference I've seen with that. Okay. Um, so another question is about the best way to report data cleaning to different stakeholders. I think the important issue with reporting to stakeholders is to keep in mind what their goals are for having the data cleaning issues addressed. Um, I know my temptation always is to tell like to report to people i just did all of this work to solve all of these data cleaning problems um, and sometimes they don't need to know all of the details of how you did it um, they just need to know if the choices that you made about data cleaning might affect the analysis or the interpretation of the analysis so i think the key point there is to identify really what the different stakeholders need to know that they don't know they need to know um, and be sure to tell that to them and also make make sure that you keep lines of communication open so that they know they can come to you with questions if they run into issues with the data cleaning that you've done. Uh, sorry to interrupt, uh, Leslie, now you're running out of time. Uh, now I'll take just one last question uh, in the chat. Okay, great. Um, I will answer the other question just with a typed answer later, but this first one mm -hmm. really strikes me. 
So as a data scientist, how can you impact data quality in the first place? I think wherever possible at your organization, try to be involved in the conversations with the people who are collecting data so that you can help affect how it's collected in the first place. That's what will have the highest impact in reducing the amount of data cleaning that you need to do in the end. Thank you. Thank you for the great talk, Leslie. Uh, this concludes our session.